Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second lecture. I think in the first lecture, some of you had a problem staying away because it was late in the afternoon. Today, the problem will be waking up. And so I hope that um, I will help you. So today is about looking uh, at making buildings safe during earthquakes from the perspective of the plans of buildings. And so most of today's talk is about looking at building plans and looking at the implications for seismic resistance. And then on Monday, we're going to be looking at building elevations and looking from the perspective of seismic resistance. So having said that, uh, we are going to begin by looking at a cross-section. Because this, this cross-section shows the inertia forces acting in a building during an earthquake. And so, everywhere in a building that has mass, we will have an inertia force. And so over every square meter of every architectural and structural element, there will be an inertia force, acting usually horizontally. And because most of the, the mass or the weight of the building is in the floor slab, you, for typical buildings, about 80% of the weight is in the floor slab. And so, in the floor slab, we have the majority of the seismic forces, these inertia forces. The ground is moving maybe to the left, and these are the inertia forces moving to the right. But also there will be inertia forces from the weights of the cladding, the columns, partitions, and other architectural elements. And so we can see these forces in section. Now we look and plan. This is a very simple building. And I'm assuming that in a Y direction, the earthquake forces are resisted by two shear walls. And so in plan, I have shown all the inertia forces. Most of the forces from the weight of the floors, but then there are also these forces uh, from the cladding. And so, our job as designers is to accept the fact that there are these forces and to transfer, transfer them horizontally into these vertical, in this case, vertical structural shear walls. And to do that, we describe the action as um, using the floor slabs as diaphragms, as horizontal beams. So during most of the life of a building, in fact, during 99.9999% of the life of a building, this is a floor slab that we are sitting on. But during those 20 seconds of earthquake shaking, our floor slab also becomes a diaphragm. The floor slab has to act as a horizontal beam. And a horizontal beam spanning between the vertical supporting structure, in this case, shear walls. And like a horizontal beam, the diaphragm has bending moments in it and shear forces in it that we need to be aware of. And so here is the, uh, the building in, in the plan, like in the Y direction, two shear walls, two structural walls. In the X direction, I'm assuming two moment frames. Uh, but at the moment, 
moment I'm just discussing the y direction because that is more critical because the diaphragm in this case is spanning the entire length of the building and so the stresses in it may be quite high and so this is a, a, a representation a plan of the, the floor diaphragm <coughs> each floor and even the roof must function as a diaphragm, as a horizontal beam. And so we can model it, structural engineers think of it like this. Uh, the supports are the shear walls. Here are the inertia forces. And the, the line is the beam, the diaphragm. Here's the deflected shape. Here's the shear force diagram. Here's the bending moment diagram. So in the middle of this diagram, the shear forces are very low. They are maximum at the shear walls. And in contrast, the maximum bending moment is at mid-span, and there is actually no bending moment uh, at the shear walls. And so this structural information is all is very important to us designers when we're thinking about penetrations in our diaphragms. Because penetrations are always necessary. Before we move to penetrations, I want to show you another scenario, uh, this building plan, where in the Y direction, we have three lines of resistance, three moment frames. And so in our engineering model, we have three supports. And here is the diaphragm, or the beam. Here are the forces, the inertia forces. And now our, our beam is a continuous beam because it's over two support, uh, well it's got three supports, and so here is the deflected shape. Now the diaphragm only needs to stand this far. And the shear force diagram uh, looks something like this, and this is the bending moment diagram. And so once again, these diagrams will guide you uh, you the architect and you the structural engineer in deciding where, where it's possible to have penetrations. This is what a diaphragm looks like. Uh, so this is what it looks like uh, from this view. Uh, it's a bit like an I-beam. This would be a, a standard beam. In this case, withstanding compression. Maybe this is a normal beam, just with some additional reinforcement in it. That might be all we need. Uh, the other, the, the tension bending moment will be taken by this beam here, shown in cross-section. And the web of the beam resists the shear forces. And so this is a cross section through a diaphragm in a steel building. Here are the edge beams, or the cords of the diaphragm. This is a cross section through a timber diaphragm, where that is plywood, probably plywood. That could be LVL or glue laminated timber. And uh, this is a diaphragm in a reinforced concrete building. This is the web of the diaphragm, resist the shear forces. And the cords are the edge beams that resist the tension or compression resulting from the bending moments. <coughs> Here's what a plywood diaphragm looks like. Uh, I don't think it's so relevant in Serbia, most likely. But uh, we use thousands of nails. 
to transfer the shear forces from one, one sheet of plywood to the next sheet of plywood. And so here we come to the problem of penetrations. Because some penetrations are actually very dangerous in earthquakes. And this is an example of a, of a dangerous penetration. Because remember, a diaphragm is like a beam, a horizontal beam. And so I'm sure that none of us would ever design a beam with a, a huge notch in it. This is a, a huge notch. And the problem with notches is that when we have uh, a load on this beam, this diaphragm, what happens is because of the notch, we get incredible increase in stresses here. And so we would get tearing in the diaphragm for sure. And the building could actually break in half. That's how serious it could be. And so um, the bad news for architects is that, that this is not acceptable. You cannot do this. But I'm going to give you a number of alternatives that enable you to achieve something identical. We'll come to that later. But this is an immediate solution that is acceptable because we've got almost a notch, but we've got the beam continuous through here. And so now we can transfer the bending moments across this area. And so this is actually okay. You can do this. And the shear forces can be resisted with this very little shear force here. In the middle of the diaphragm, very little shear force. And so there's no problem. This is probably a better location, optimal, with the penetration in the middle like that. But often that is not suitable for an architect for various reasons. This is another um, dangerous situation where a penetration is needed right adjacent to a structural wall or a moment frame. And so the problem is that this is the area where the shear forces are maximum. And yet we have very little shear strength, just those two small areas. And so we can, be, we can be sure that this is where we will get severe damage. Severe cracking and tearing of the floor diaphragm. And so this, this is really quite bad. But I will offer you some solutions later. Now as I said, um, <coughs> In the buildings we design, almost always the floor slabs can function as diaphragms. Maybe they need a little bit more reinforcement. Usually very little, sometimes no more. It depends on the span of the diaphragm and its depth in plan. But when we come to uh, the roof of buildings, the roofs, they could be lightweight. And then we, we have to create a diaphragm for them as well. And so this is how we create diaphragms, for example, using structural steel or wood. In other words, diaphragms in lightweight roofs or lightweight single-story buildings. We need diaphragms like this. And in these cases, our diaphragms look like horizontal trusses. That's how you can think of them. A diaphragm is a horizontal truss. It works horizontally. And so 
this is like a single story building. And say uh, the wind the wind blows on the wall here, um, usually half the wind goes directly to the foundations. The other half comes up to the roof level. And the, these forces are resisted by the diaphragm that transfers the wind and earthquake forces horizontally into this cross bracing on this end of the diaphragm and on that end. And so the horizontal forces are resisted by and transferred by the horizontal diaphragm, the horizontal trusses. As an architect, you can choose the geometry of this diaphragm. You can have two trusses, or just one. And the truss, if you wanted just one truss, it could actually go there. If you have just one truss, the members are larger, of course, because they are, they are half as number of structural members, therefore the members have to be bigger. But you have a lot of flexibility over the, uh, the configuration, the layout of this diaphragm. The main thing is it must span horizontally between the lines of resistance. In this case, uh, cross-braced frames. So that's what we need in the Y direction. We also need to create diaphragms in the X direction. And so we need to design something like this that works in the X direction. These trusses are strong to resist the forces in the X direction. And they will transfer the inertia forces to this bracing here and the bracing on the other side of the building in any direction. Okay, our, our roof structure is going to be safe no matter what direction of shaking. Every building needs this. Even if there's no earthquake, you need this to resist the wind load and to transfer it. It's just that in seismic design, uh, sometimes these braces might be a bit bigger because the seismic forces might be larger. Depends where we are building. And so in our final plan, this is what our diaphragms might look like. Um, and this, as I say, there's a lot of flexibility. Uh, if we wanted to, this truss could be moved here. Or it could be here. Or we could have every bay with bracing. In that case, the bracing members would be very slender. You know, it would be very small. And so, as an architect, there's a lot of flexibility as to the configuration of, of a diaphragm like this. But sometimes, an architect will say to me, Andrew, I don't want any diaphragm. I don't want any cross bracing, thank you. Nothing. Well, fortunately, there's a solution. And the solution we call bond beams. You may not like this solution, but it's the only solution a structural engineer can offer you if you don't want to have cross bracing. And it's, it's a rather strange solution, but imagine this is a, a single story building. Maybe these walls are very high. It doesn't really matter. And we have the inertia forces or the wind forces 
acting on the war. With the solution of bond beams, it works like this. The wind hits the wall, or the inertia forces inside the wall are acting like this. Half of the forces, or oh, the forces cause the wall to bend. The wall will bend. Half the forces go to the foundations. The other half go to the strange structural member called a bond beam. What, what would be the term you would use in Serbia, Svetlana? Is that what? It's, it's recognised. No. No. Well, yes, it's recognized for masonry, but not for reinforced concrete. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's what is the type of walls. In masonry, it could be that Okay, well this material, this wall, could be any material. It could be masonry, could be reinforced concrete, <coughs> could be steel, could be wood. It doesn't matter. We still need these bond beams. And you can see that these beams are very strange because they are deep horizontally. Normally a beam is rotating, isn't it? But there's no point in rotating this because we have a wall. This beam is all about resisting horizontal load. And that's why it's so deep. And the role of this beam is to span the length of the building. And so if your building is very long, that dimension becomes very, very wide. This dimension, as a rule of thumb, would be like the span of the building divided by 20. So if your building is 20 meters long, this has to be at least one meter deep or wide. And so that is the first option for an architect who doesn't want to have a cross brace diaphragm. There's one final option actually, and that's summarized here. It is possible to avoid bond beams. And the way we do it is like this. We need to cantilever our walls. And, and this solution is usually expensive and it requires very thick walls at the base. And like the thickness of that wall would typically be um, the height of the wall, say divided by, by 10 or 8. And, uh, and that might be a problem. But if we have a cantilever wall, then all the forces, wind and earthquake, strike it, the cantilever bends, and it transfers all those loads directly down to the foundation. And so we don't need a horizontal diaphragm. So this is what you can do. If you, you don't want a diaphragm, you don't want a bond beam, then I'm sorry, the only option is that. If you don't want thick walls, you can have thin walls, but you need like buttresses. And so we go back to almost classical architecture and use buttressing or reinforced concrete cantilever ribs. So just to finish with this section of my lecture, I want to just remind you of the power of diaphragms. And we're going to look for a couple of minutes at this building in Belgium. Um, I haven't visited it, but many years ago I saw this image and I thought, wow, this is incredible. 
Because this building looks so unstable. And in fact, if we look at a cross section, we have to conclude that this building is ridiculously unstable. And so I want to just um, stop for a couple of minutes and I want you to turn to the person next to you and answer two questions. The first question is, what was in the architect's mind? And the second question is, how is this building stable? Please, I'll give you two minutes. It's not part of the circle. It's an arc. 
Exactly. That's the question. What's at the end of this building? And I deliberately didn't show you what was at the end. Because what is at the end of the building are sheer walls. And they connect to the floor diaphragms. And so as the building starts to topple, the diaphragms resist the toppling because of their connection into the shear walls at the end. I was naughty. I didn't show you this. But some very strong shear walls. And they must be at each end, mustn't they? They have to be at each end. There's no other explanation. So even under live loads, the diaphragms in this building are critical. And if there is an earthquake in Belgium, the diaphragms will have to work even harder to transfer these inertia forces back into these shear walls. What is the length of that building, uh, this client, and you know? I don't know. I would say that it's probably, I'd say this is probably about 8 metres. So I, I could imagine it being about 60 metres. 60 to 80 metres. What I haven't discussed with you, and what I don't actually even know, is what about the longitudinal resistance? Maybe there's some moment frame action. And these are like pin joints, rigid joints up here. Maybe frame action this way. I'm not exactly sure. So this building illustrates the power of diaphragms. Oh, the battery is running low. Uh, is this plugged into power? Thank you. I think we might have to uh, restart. Have you got any questions you'd like to ask just while we're waiting? Or comments? Any comments? Who is the behind the building? Yeah, sorry, I don't know. Um, I actually discovered this building uh, many, many years ago, and um, and I didn't make a note of it, so it would be very hard to trace it. In my first lecture, I mentioned to you that during an earthquake, um, all buildings will have a, a, at least a small amount of torsion, you know, due to the earthquake waves coming up from underneath the building. But sometimes, sometimes torsion can become very severe. Uh, because of the way we design the building. And actually the most dangerous buildings for torsion are buildings on the corner of um, the corner of city blocks. Because imagine these are the streets here. Uh, this is another building here. And so almost always there are very stiff walls, uh, particularly for reasons of fire. And so during an earthquake, the, the inertia forces uh, can be thought to act at the center of mass of, of, of each floor of the building, which is basically the center of plan of each building. And so for shaking in the y direction, 
the earthquake forces will, will, will act in the center of mass here. But the forces are resisted uh, by the, the, the stiffer and stronger wall here. This wall would probably be a thousand <coughs> times stiffer and stronger than, than these columns and beams. These are so flexible. And so most of the resistance during the earthquake happens on this line. And so the earthquake acts like that. It's resisted on that line. The building will twist in torsion. And as it twists, this column, the, these columns in particular, they will be moved sideways um, quite a large distance. And that could cause them to collapse. So what's the solution to this problem? Well, here's one solution. Uh, and this is to make the firewalls non-structural. And to provide our building with two moment frames in each direction. Then we have a symmetrical structure and the center of resistance is the same point as the center of mass, more or less. And the firewalls are non-structural. And so they could be of any material, but if they are strong firewalls, if, say, they are solid masonry, well, then we would normally separate them, have separation gaps, uh, and we would fill those gaps with fire-resistant material. So that's one solution to the, the corner building problem. Um, another solution, which is sort of more interesting, is to connect the firewall to our frame with very slender, say, steel rods at each floor level. And so that means that during an earthquake, the inertia forces of the firewall are transferred into the floor diaphragm of this building. And so the inertia forces from that wall are ultimately resisted here and here. And then for shaking in this direction, the inertia forces from this heavy wall are transferred through the tides into the diaphragm and resisted by those lines. <coughs> so, you know, here are a couple of solutions where you might need these strong firewalls, but you want to avoid the torsion. Another problem and plan from a seismic performance perspective is re-entrant corners. And that's when we have buildings with these interesting forms. And I'm going to show you how you can have these forms as architects, but yet have safe um, structures during an earthquake. Each of these forms is really a problem during earthquake shaking. And the reason is because the arms of the form, they deflect a lot further than like the body. And so in an earthquake, it would happen like this. This arm would flap around and especially if there are penetrations here, especially if there are elevators and stairs, this area of the diaphragm would get really severely damaged and the building, um, you know, would be at great risk of collapse. And so that is why we avoid these types of re-entrant corners. This is the re-entrant corner here and here. How do we avoid this problem? 
we separate. It's very simple. Well, it's simple in theory. It's not quite so simple for the architect who has to detail these gaps. But every day of the week in um, countries like New Zealand, um, Japan, California, and so on, architects are detailing these seismic separation gaps. The next problem is diaphragm discontinuity. And that's when we have these sort of massive slots in our diaphragm. Like the upper diagram is the ideal. You know, a solid planar diaphragm that can act like a horizontal beam spanning between the two shear walls. But often, an architect would like, well, an architect would need a penetration here. And so if we have that penetration, the forces can't get into the shear wall. It's impossible, because this is air. This is not concrete. This is an opening. And so this would cause terrific damage in this region of the building, probably leading to collapse. So how can we achieve this? Well, here is a good option. We move our structural wall from here to here. And so now we've got a really good diaphragm spanning between that wall and that wall. And what we need to do is, is to create a small bond beam here and here. Uh, and actually a bond beam here, so that the inertia forces of this non-structural wall can be transferred and resisted by the main building itself here. And in this direction, these could actually be pins. So this building can move, uh, this could rotate, it doesn't matter, and maybe this wall can look after itself. It's probably strong enough in this direction just because of its own material. So that's, that's a, um, a good way, I believe, to allow a large penetration um, next to a wall, but we have to move the wall we must move that wall so the inertia forces can um, enter into it. Now, what about if the architect wants a total slot in the building like that? Well, the good news is it's possible. I mean, originally, the engineer probably thought, I'm going to use two structural walls or two moment frames in this building to resist all the earthquake force. And these columns will just resist gravity. Just gravity. But when the architect decides <coughs> to put an atrium or an interior street or something through, then it's impossible for the diaphragm to stand. And so what we must do is to separate our building into two structures. One building, two structures. This is like a huge separation gap. And so this is one structure. We must have two lines of resistance in this direction and two lines of resistance in the X direction. And the same with this building. I mean, it would be better if that frame was here, because we'd get better torsion resistance. But this is OK. And it means the architect can put slender, slender gravity-only columns next to the atrium 
Maybe because we want to bring in maximum natural light, you know, into those areas. So this is a uh, this is a solution to what appears like a very dangerous situation. And once again, the solution: one building, two structures. Uh, another problem we have in diaphragms is uh, when the diaphragms have steps. This is a section. See the step here? It means that the diaphragm is unable to act like a beam, a horizontal beam, because of this kink. It's uh, very difficult to have a beam that is kinked, uh, like a plant. And so, because this diaphragm works in, in plan, this, is, uh, this makes it very difficult for the diaphragm to act like a horizontal beam. And so, it would be better to replace these two shear walls, maybe with three moment frames. And so now, this diaphragm spans between there and there, and there and there. The diaphragm doesn't have to span the whole length of the building. And so if you want steps, you need to have more frequent frames or walls resisting your forces in that direction. Another problem that we need to find solutions for. Offset walls. And this is the, the problem as illustrated here, where this wall is offset from the lower wall. And so, I mean, this, I'm assuming this is a structural wall. And so the earthquake forces um, are attacking in the y direction and they are resisted by, say, a wall on this line, and this wall here. The forces go down the wall, but the wall is not continuous. And so the forces try and go back through this diaphragm, and then down that wall. Now, it's not too difficult, actually, to design this diaphragm to be strong, we could add an extra reinforcement. But the problem is, is due to the over to the turning, the turning effect on this wall. Like the problem is this moment here. And so the solution is ideally to put columns here to withstand that turning. Like that column will be in compression, this column will be in tension. It will be in tension. And we would, we would make a strong diaphragm. But of course, the architect, as an architect, you may not want uh, those columns there at all that would probably destroy your concept. And so the solution for you is, um, is first of all, to make this, uh, to make that stru the structural wall go right up. Make it go right up to the roof diaphragm. That will solve the problem. If you cannot have a structural wall up here, which is probably the case, then you would make a moment frame here and a moment frame there. And so this wall you would make non-structural. You would make it flexible. Ideally out of lightweight material. This would be your strong moment frame there and this would be your strong moment frame here. And then you can have your cantilevered form no problem at all. You just have to make sure that your structure uh, is vertical 
within the plan of your builder up there. I'm getting very close uh, to concluding this lecture. Uh, this might be one of the last subjects to discuss. After every damaging earthquake, we see lots of evidence of buildings pounding each other. It's horrible. And here in Mexico City uh, in the 80s, uh, some of these multi-story buildings had terrific pounding and um, quite horrific actually. And so we as designers have to avoid this. The solution is really easy. We must separate. This is an elevation. We must create gaps between our building and our boundary so that our building that we are designing so it won't cross the boundary line because if it crosses the boundary line and pounds the neighbor's building we will be woken up one night by the police and we will be arrested i'm just joking but it could be serious and so our responsibility is to have a separation gap and plan at least around three sides of a building so that we don't hit the neighbours. We've got to keep our building during an earthquake inside our boundary. I think the City Council, it doesn't mind if our building goes into the street. It doesn't matter. But it does matter if our building hits the neighbours. And so in most countries where there is significant seismicity, the building codes require us to have these gaps. And it makes it difficult for the architect because it means the architect cannot build here. And so early in the design process, the architect has to have a conversation with the structural engineer and say, structural engineer, how much gap do I need for our building? And the structural engineer will say, well, it depends. How high is the building? The higher the building, the wider the gap. How flexible is your building? And the architect says, what do you mean? And the engineer says, do you want to use moment frames or shear walls? If you use moment frames, your building is going to be quite flexible and the gap has to be quite big. If you use shear walls, your building will be quite stiff and the gap can be small. So even on day one, of a design in an urban area, the engineer and architect have to sit down and discuss these issues. Because that gap, that can be quite large. If your building is 20 stories, you know, the gap could be that wide, could be wider. Um, this one, um, this comment actually, it's very important for context here in Belgrade, for example where we usually have an existing buildings on the left and right side and there is a new building in the middle, we must have seen that. So the boundary is, is not defined as the location of the existing building, isn't it so? It is because you have to consider the gap, the gap size depends on the expected displacements of the other building which will be taller than, than the other building. Both of them actually, yeah, so that is, that is the, the gap size depends on the on both buildings, not only on, on one. It does, but as a designer, I'm responsible sure. for my site. Sure. 
Okay. So I've got to make sure my building won't cross the boundary. And boundary is defined as the location of the of the the, the plot. Or yes, the, yes, the plot. The plot. And maybe the existing, maybe there's a new development, or then probably the old building is right on the boundary. That's right. That's exactly. Exactly. That's, that's the norm for yeah. building near old buildings because the old building will be here. And so sometimes us designers, we have to think about the implications for our, for our new building because this building will hit our building. And we have to put mitigation measures to prevent our building collapsing because it's being hit by the neighbour. Well, at least we have to think about it, and we may discuss the problem with our client. Separation gaps in a building. Uh, we can create, as I say, two separate structures. And so there'd be this physical gap here. I mean, it might be hidden uh, with cladding, with flashing. Uh, the architects will, will detail that to be appropriately, um, you know, hidden or expressed. I mean, you could celebrate it if you wanted to. Or you could, um, you could avoid, you could avoid the second row of columns here by having your floor slab uh, supported on core bolts or cantilevers and you could have a, a separation gap here. And so there are various alternatives for you for treating that gap and the, and the gravity loads that occur. But the gap usually looks like this inside a building. Uh, this is the gap here, the seismic gap. It's usually covered with what we call a, a, a cover plate. Uh, this would be fire resistance. I mean, you could have some ceiling detailing. But the cover plate is just anchored usually on one side. And then when the building, when the buildings come together, the structures come together, this cover plate, it just moves up. See that detail is very important, that 45 degree angle. So the cover plate can just ride up and the building can the buildings can just move independently. And this is what it can look like. Um, this is the airport in San Francisco. Um, this is a very wide cover plate. I mean, the gap's probably about that much. That's a wide gap between these two structures. Um, here's the cover plate. You know, it's nicely done. Um, it's also got to have a cover the gap in the walls and there's got to be some design covering the gap in the ceiling and I'm not so sure about that but I'm confident this is a very good and adequate design and that's all I want to say thank you Questions, same as uh, Thursday, please feel free now. The second lecture, so we're not moderating officially. Any question regarding any of the discussion that you had? I actually have a question. Uh, it's more like uh, regarding the first part of the talk. Uh, I like how we covered the topic of diagrams. It's uh, very poorly covered in engineering books, I find it when I was teaching that. But when you talked about these horizontal uh, trusses that would apply, or other solutions that would apply to a case of flexible diagrams, when the roof, when the floor system is something like a steel, uh, steel, um, some kind of steel structure or a steel covering or or a timber that would be probably applicable for timber. So is that, that is what uh, I think is important to mention. Because here we have mostly in residential buildings and even commercial concrete 
floors, so that wouldn't be necessary. It would be only for flexible, for case of flexible datas. So what examples, let's say New Zealand, do you have? Is it, has it been used um, in this context? And what kind of buildings, uh, what applications uh, did you have for this uh, horizontal chassis? Oh, OK. Well, um, in every, every supermarket building in New Zealand, you walk into the supermarket and you see that. Every, every, so every, every single story building with a light roof. Uh, I mean, I mentioned supermarkets because, as you know, they are never, we would say, works of architecture. And so the architect never bothers to hide this bracer. Um, but in a, in a more sophisticated, say you had a, a single story art gallery building um, made out of timber or, or steel, you would still have this, but often the architect would hide it, you know, because it wouldn't be appropriate to express it architecturally. So, um, so for every, every light roof, uh, we require something like this. If we didn't use this, we would use plywood. And so, which we would use, say, for a large house. And so, if this was a, a, a wooden building, or even a steel building with a light, a light roof, uh, we would probably clear the entire roof with, uh, with plywood, and, then, and it would be a really effective plywood diaphragm. Yeah, so, so these are the, the solutions, the, they are basically the two solutions for lightweight roofs. But as you mentioned, if you've got a concrete roof, well then you've got your diaphragm, haven't you? Um, because of the strength of that area of concrete working as a horizontal beam. Yeah. And how did these diaphragms behave in the New Zealand earthquakes, for example? Do you have any? Uh, yeah, damage from, let's say, the flexibility. Yeah, well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I haven't read, I haven't seen any evidence of any damage to these diaphragms. Because um, most of the buildings that had been, that were damaged or demolished, uh, would have had roof diaphragms like this. Because in New Zealand, we avoid a concrete roof because our philosophy in New Zealand is to build as light as possible and we, we avoid heavy roofs and so almost every building uh, would have a diaphragm but you know many buildings would have lines of moment frames say like that so the diaphragm only has to span that distance. And in that case, we don't need that. This sort of diaphragm only is needed if, if the diaphragm span is long. But if we have frequent lines of resistance, like moment frames, then the diaphragm only has to span that distance. And so, I mean, plywood, be, plywood would do the trick. Because, you know, normally that would be less than 10 metres. And, and that distance would be more than 10 metres. And so plywood uh, would, would make an excellent diaphragm. But yeah, that's an interesting question. No, no one, to my knowledge, has reported um, problems of light weight diaphragms. But on my lecture, is it on Wednesday? On the 12th. On the 12th. I'm going to show you horrific damage to concrete diaphragms. This was one of our main problems. And the, the reason for the damage uh, is very unexpected. So you're anticipating the... That's right. It's a real mystery that I will reveal on Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you.
I have a question, please, uh, about the slide where you showed the step in the diagram, the, the pink that you said. Yes. And you, you discussed about solving it in the y direction. But can you, can you tell us something about solving that case for the x direction, where the diagrams kind of clash there, pink the bottom? Yes. Can you? <coughs> yes, in, in the x direction, the problem is not so severe, but it, there is a problem nonetheless because the inertia forces have to be transferred along the whole length of the building to be resisted by these two shear walls. And so during X direction shaking, there's tension and compression in the diaphragm here. Now, tension and compression here will, will, will cause large local bending moments in those columns. That's right. So we could design for that if we wanted to by putting additional reinforcement and shear, uh, bending and shear reinforcement in that area. Or we could try and rely on some form of horizontal tying. Like we might we might have a secondary tie member to bring these inertia forces directly into our shear walls. So we have to think here yeah, really carefully about the, the low parts. How do these inertia forces go from here into there? Do they go up like that? Which actually isn't very good because we'll probably get shear failure there. Or, or should we put a, a beam like that in? Can, can we do that at each side? Uh, we have to come up with a solution, but there are, there are numerous approaches. But it's a really great point. Any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, you can also ask and you are in the lecture <coughs> on Monday, so the next lecture is on Monday, final lecture is on Monday at 5, uh, 5 p.m. at the same, in the same uh, room as the first, uh, room 200. Uh, yes. hmm? So, uh, thank you very much and thank you Andrew for giving up this lecture. Thank you.